Our gospel lesson this morning comes from John chapter 20, and this is, this is a gospel lesson that's familiar to many of us. Um, if you preach from the Revised Common Lectionary, this, this gospel or something very similar to it comes up every year the week after Easter. The disciples are locked away in a room. Jesus has been crucified, and they are afraid for their lives. And in the midst of this locked room, they have a surprise visitor. If you would please stand for the reading of the gospel. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my fingers in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing, you may have life in his name. The word of God for the people of God. Be Please be seated. I love to read. I have always loved to read, as long as I can remember. From the time I learned to read, I loved to read. I was really fortunate as a child um, from the time that I was very little, my parents had many, many books in our house. And when I was very young and before I could read, it was picture books, wonderful picture books. And my parents would, would read to me, and, and every night they would read me a bedtime story. And that became such a wonderful habit that still today I read myself to sleep. It's a wonderful way to separate myself from the day and enter into a calm sleeping pattern. Then we got to a part, a place when you get a little bit older and still you're, you're, you're still learning to read. You know the little words, you're still learning the big words and the adults in your life, the teachers and the parents, they want you to move from those wonderful big picture books to those darn chapter books. Those chapter books that are real thick and they have little tiny type and great big words and no pictures and what, what fun is that? But in second, third, and fourth grade in my school, they did something that was so smart, and maybe they did this everywhere, I don't know. But in second, third, and fourth grade, about those times you need to be shifting from picture books to chapter books. When we would come back from lunch and go into our classroom, our teacher would have some wonderful chapter book that was just a little beyond our ability to read and would spend about 20 minutes just reading to us from it. So it would be like, the original Wizard of Oz, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Secret Garden, A Wrinkle in Time, wonderful, wonderful stories that just trigger the imagination and have a tremendous underlying message. And what was great as kids is we could sit there and just listen to the teacher read, and we came to realize that in just listening with our own imagination, we could come up with our own pictures. We could decide what the settings looked like. We could decide what the characters looked like. And 
from those teachers reading those books, that created in me a desire, a need, a want to learn to read better so that I could read those books myself because what would happen is after 20 minutes the teacher would stop and we would just groan because we wanted her to keep going. It was brilliant what they did. It was absolutely brilliant. And I spent a lot of time at the library and I started reading chapter books pretty early on. I love to read, I love books. But what I really love is a good story. That's why I love to read and I love good books. Because I love a good story and not all stories are in books, right? Things that happen to us during the day can become a story. I remember when I was growing up, my parents and my family, we would eat dinner together every night. And I still don't know how my mom and dad made that happen, but they did. And I'm thankful that they did. My dad, almost every night, would come home with a story from work. And it would be something that happened on his coffee break or at lunch, maybe, maybe in the office itself. He worked with the same people as long as I lived with him. And all of us kids, we knew the people he worked with. They were sort of the characters in his story. And his stories were never told at anyone's expense but his own. But it was always something funny. Something funny had happened almost every day. And he would tell us this story, and he would get us laughing so hard. And when my brother and I were younger, we just went with it. But you know, we got to an age where we'd get done laughing, and we would look at him, and we'd say, is that a true story? And he'd say, well, most of it. The crux of the story was true, but the man was really good with writer's license, and I think that's fine. Our lives are made up of stories. You know, we just celebrated Easter. And on Easter Sunday here, seeing especially the little ones come in in their, in their Easter suits and dresses and their nice clothes, the first thing it reminded me of was when my kids were young enough that I could pick out their outfits. I missed that. But it also reminded me of when I was growing up and what Easter was like, and I thought if you have kids or grandkids and you were wanting to share with them what Easter was like when you were growing up, would you come up with some kind of bullet point checklist of what Easter was like? Probably not. What you would do is you would turn it into a story. You would think back to a time when you were young and, and maybe your mom and you went shopping or the Easter bunny came or something and you would, you would create a setting and you would explain the other people who were there and you would turn it into a story. Because stories are intriguing and stories are memorable. And stories can be fiction or nonfiction. But what is truth? See, even in fiction, greater truths can be told. Jesus was a master storyteller. You think of the parables that Jesus would tell. One, for example, that probably many of us are familiar with is the parable of the prodigal son. There was a father and he had two sons. And the younger son wanted to go out into the big world and make it on his own. So he insisted that his father split the inheritance and give him his half. His father does it. He gives him his inheritance and the younger son goes out into the world. And instead of making it in the world, he squanders his money and he becomes destitute. He becomes so desperate that he realizes the only way he's going to be able to survive is to return home and beg for his father to take him back, not even as a son, but just as a hired hand so he would have something to eat. As the son is returning home from a distance, the father sees him coming. And as soon as the father sees him coming, he runs down the path to meet him. And before the son can ever ask the question, the father has him in a warm and loving embrace. This is a story of God and God's relationship with us and our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. But is it a true story? Stories are one of the best teaching tools. Stories help to explain greater truths in intriguing and memorable ways. They spark our own imagination about what's possible and they create in us a desire a need, a want for greater experiences of our own. But is this story true? It depends on how you look at it. Between 1650 and 1700, the age of the Enlightenment was ushered in. 
The Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason, was a cultural movement of intellectuals, and it began in Europe and gradually moved to the American colonies. Its purpose was to reform society. It used reason, and it challenged ideas grounded in faith and tradition. It advanced, it advanced knowledge through scientific method, and it promoted scientific thought. There was so much about the Enlightenment that was marvelous and wonderful. But it's interesting because when that time came, what we came to understand as what is true completely shifted. Since the Enlightenment, truth equals fact, and fact can be proven. That's how we see truth. When my brother and I asked my dad, is that a true story? He knew what we meant. We meant, did it happen exactly like you told it? That's what we meant. Since the Enlightenment, truth equals fact, and fact can be proven. But pre-Enlightenment, this is hard to get our heads around. Truth had nothing to do with fact. Before the Enlightenment, what was considered to be truth had nothing to do with fact. That is really hard for us to understand. But we need to because Jesus and his disciples were way pre-enlightenment. And when Jesus told his parables, they were received as the truth. Not because anybody believed these things actually happened, but because it was a teaching of greater truth. Following the Enlightenment, when human beings got to the place where truth equals fact and what is true can be proven, the Bible became a problem for many, many people. The Bible is a book of truth, but it isn't all factual. The Bible is a book of truth, but it isn't all factual. What do we do with that? Well, let's keep that in mind as we look at our scripture. As I said, this scripture follows Easter every year. And it is the disciples locked away in a room and they are afraid for their lives. After what happened to Jesus, they are afraid the same will happen to them. And they have themselves locked away and Jesus comes and stands among them and says, peace be with you. And every year when I preach on this scripture, I always get stuck right here. I can't help but get stuck right here. These guys are locked away in a room because they're afraid for their lives, and without a door opening, there's suddenly another person in the room speaking. I mean, I think that's frightening. I think that's startling. But they all seem to take it in stride. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. <gasps> How wonderful for all of them. Except Thomas wasn't there. So Jesus leaves and Thomas returns. Can you imagine, first of all, the change in the atmosphere of that room? When Thomas left, and you know, and why isn't he there? We don't know. There's all kinds of speculation. If these guys were going to be locked in this room for a while, they'd need food, they'd need drink. He might have been out getting that. He might have been getting messages to their families to let them know they were okay, or he might have just needed a breath of fresh air. We really don't know. But when he returns, can you imagine the change in the demeanor of these guys? When he left, it was probably solemn, and they were all wondering what in the world they were going to do with their lives, and they were feeling like they were in danger. They return, and they say to him, We've seen the Lord! And Thomas says, well, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and I put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. Now, I'll tell you what. See, I think we read that as post-enlightenment people. And we need to remember, this is pre-enlightenment. I think too often we read what Thomas says there and we think he doesn't believe the disciples. He doesn't believe what they said. He doesn't believe that actually happened. He's going to need to see it for himself. And I don't think that's what he means at all. I don't think that's what he means at all. He has lived with these guys and worked with these guys and served with these guys for three years. He gets back to this room. The whole demeanor of the room has changed, and they're all telling him the same story. You don't think he believes that? I think he believes them. 
I think he believes it happened. I think what he's saying is, I need to have my own experience of the presence of Jesus. I need to have the Holy Spirit breathed on me to believe as you do. We need to remember, at this time, he hasn't had the Holy Spirit breathed on him. We have received the Holy Spirit. We are able to experience the presence of God through the Holy Spirit without seeing God. Thomas didn't need to be reassured of the presence of God or the reality of God. What he needed was he needed to know that Jesus loved him too. John Wesley, founder of Methodism. Of course, he lived in England. He was an Anglican priest his entire life. He never intended to start a new denomination. When he was 34 in 1738, he had just recently returned to England from America. He'd been here on a mission trip, and it was a disaster. It did not go well at all, and he was questioning his faith. And one night he decided to go to a worship service on Aldersgate Street. Some of you have heard of this, Wesley's Aldersgate experience. He decides to go to a worship service on Aldersgate Street. And the thing is, he really doesn't feel like it. He really doesn't want to go, but he goes anyway. And I think that in itself is an example that he's setting. When we are questioning our faith, when we are questioning God, when we are feeling low, those are the times it's easiest just to skip worship, to skip prayer time, to skip your Bible study class. And those are really the times you want to push through. You just need to push through. And he does. So he goes to this worship service on Aldersgate Street. And when he gets there, there is a preface to Paul's letter to the Romans that's being read. And this preface was written by Martin Luther, and it's being read. And he has an experience while this is happening. And he writes in his journal... About a quarter before nine, while the leader was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. This was a transformational moment for John Wesley. Is this proof of God's existence? No, he didn't need proof of God's existence. He believed God existed. But what this was was an experience of the presence of God that helped John Wesley understand what a precious child of God he was. That God loved even him. And everything was different for him after that. John Wesley, Thomas the Disciple, you, me, pre-enlightenment, post-enlightenment, really we're all the same. For most of us, maybe not all of us, but most of us, most of us aren't looking for proof of God's existence. But most all of us really want assurance of God's love. And you know, for some of us, that happens when we're children. For some of you, it happened when you were children. Somehow you came to understand that God loved you and you have lived out your life and your faith accordingly. What a blessing. For other people, that experience of the presence of God that makes God's love so apparent comes later in our journey. You know, you look at John Wesley. Here's a man who devoted his life to God and the church and he was well into his ministry before his heart was strangely warmed. And the interesting thing is you can tell by the way he wrote in his journal, it came as a surprise. He didn't even know what was missing until he received it. And when he did, everything changed. God's love is all around us. You, each and every one of you, is a precious, precious child of God. Each and every one of you is a beautiful, true story of God. And all of our stories are still unfolding. Stay open 
to God's love. Share with God what it is that you need to understand God's love for you. God will give you what you need. And maybe God may even surprise you. Amen.